Hello everyone, um, today we are going to look at the life of James. James known as the brother of John and um, let me let me begin with the end of his life and then we're going to go back to discuss some of the details of his life. In Acts chapter 12 we find the first disciple, the first apostle that is martyred and, 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 and that is James. Um, in, in verse 1 in Acts 12, we read this. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration that imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Here is one of the most stunning chapters in the book of Acts because it begins with the sad news of James' martyrdom. James, known as John's brother, John uh, the Apostle, was the youngest of the apostles, most likely the youngest. And James seems to be known a, li a little bit like um, uh, Andrew. Andrew is Peter's brother. James is John's brother. It seems to be that their life, um, uh, their lives are um, very much linked to uh, their more famous brothers. But in Acts 12, uh, the chapter begins with the sad news of his execution. And it, it is a mystery. A mystery that only God will be able to explain whenever we get to heaven. To me, it's quite extraordinary that James gets killed in chapter 12, but yet Peter gets miracul miraculously saved from prison in the same chapter. So to me, it's, 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 it's a mystery. I... I you know, there seems to be much more than just um, the the surface understanding of James getting killed and Peter getting rescued. However, we understand that James is part of that inner circle. We, we, we see throughout the Gospels that Jesus always took Peter, James, and John. They seem to be the trio that accompanied Jesus absolutely everywhere. It was the three that were there at the transfiguration on the mountain. It was, it was these, these three that Jesus takes to uh, raise Jairus' dead, daughter from the dead. And it is these three that go and pray with Jesus in that most intimate, agonizing moment. We, we do not hope we do not have much uh, many details about his life. He never seems to uh, say much. He never stands out. He, and he's always mentioned alongside his younger, better known brother. Uh, uh, in Acts 12, actually, uh, um, the end of his life seems to be um, the only time um, he's mentioned on his own. Every other time it's in this trio, Peter, James and John, or is always connected to his uh, brother. But, However, from the bigger picture of the Gospels, we understand that James comes from a fishing family. Uh, his fishing family uh, seems to be more pro prominent than um, the family of Peter and Andrew. They are called the sons of Zebedee. So Zebedee was a uh, fisherman. His business seems to be much more prosperous than Peter and John and, and Andrew's business. Uh, James and John had employed servants. We know that from Mark one twenty. Uh, we know from uh, John eighteen that they were known to the high priest. So they were moving in much higher circles than Peter and Andrew. Um, we also know from church history that Zebedee was also a Levite serving into the temple. And, and so we, 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 we have a background of someone 
who is high up socially, high up economically. Uh, and, and now as part of Jesus in the circle, he gets to experience the most intimate and powerful miracles. Jerry's daughter, as I mentioned, the Mount of Transfiguration, He's there with Jesus on the Mount of Olives. He's there with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He witnessed along with Peter and John. Uh, he witnessed Jesus' power, glory, sovereignty, his agony. He experienced uh, Jesus' intimate relationship with the Father. However, there are several things uh, that we know about James and John. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus nick gives them a nickname, the Sons of Thunder. James is known as a very passionate man. And, and I suppose there's absolutely nothing wrong with passion. It's very important that we are passionate for the Lord. But when you have so much passion and zeal, sometimes if it's not directed in the right way, you can end up um, in very difficult and embarrassing situations. Um, for example, in, in Luke 9, if you come with me to Luke 9, in, in Luke 9, uh, Jesus um, wants to go through a city in Samaria and uh, the Samaritans um, refuse, to, um, refuse to, to let him pass. And, and so, um, uh, look, at, look at verse 50, um, 51. At, as, as the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village, a Samaritan village, to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? <laughs> but Jesus turned and rebuked them. So they went on to another village. It makes me laugh. It makes me smile to see this passion, this zeal uh, for, for, for the Lord. At any side of opposition, James is ready to, let's get fire and burn them up. Obviously, um, the, he's not just saying that because he hates the Samaritan. He's saying that because he knows so much of the history of Israel. He knows that Samaritans are people that have historically mixed the worship of the true God with the worship of idols and the Canaanite gods. He knows that on the very same spot, Elijah called fire from heaven and burned the soldiers that were coming to arrest him. So basically, John is not saying these things out of hatred, but he's saying these things out of a deep zeal and understanding of history. But Jesus is not in the business of repeating history. Jesus is in the business of offering grace. Ever since I moved to Ireland, I become much more aware of the history that comes with this place. The history of prejudice and hatred. God is not in the business of repeating history. God is in the business of offering grace. There is another instance that gives us a sense of this misguided, misplaced passion. In Matthew 20, if you come with me to Matthew 20, um, there is an interesting interaction between um, Jesus and most likely James and John's mother. Um, it says here in verse 20, then the mother of James and John, this comes straight after Jesus talks about his death. He talks about uh, how he's going to be arrested 
and um, he's telling them about um, how the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with the whip and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. At this exact moment, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my sons, my two sons, sit in places of honor next to you on your right and on on uh, and the other on the left. Um, there seems to be a continual race among the apostles. It's not the first and only time when the apostles are inquiring about who's the greatest. It's the time when our human desire for honor and prestige kicks in. It's the same here. Uh, however, there seems to be even worse uh, or it looks worse when it's the mother that comes to kind of put, ask a favor. And the favor is in the fact, I, I want my sons to be so close to you that are special and above the rest. It, it seems to me that the passion has blinded their eyes and now they want to be above everybody else and i'm not saying that james and john are the only ones that are guilty of this all of them have argued over and over again who's the greatest in the kingdom of god it seems to me that this luciferanian sin this sin that caused everything to go bad it still affects people today i want to be great i want to sit on the throne i want to be honored i want to be in a place of privilege and jesus diverts the conversation and says you don't know what you're asking are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. They had no idea what they were talking about. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or on my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. And it is right in a sense, Jesus directs them to suffering. To me, I see that even in today's world, um, we seem to thrive or desire places of leadership and honor. But we often do not realize that to be a leader comes with great responsibility. In the persecuted church, let's say that take, for example, the church in Iran, to be a leader of a church or to be a leader of a ministry automatically brings a prison sentence and this is what jesus is trying to say you want places of honor for the sake of honor but you don't understand that those places come with a great cost to be a leader sometimes means to make decisions that are difficult painful often will attract the misunderstanding of others or the criticism of others or the hatred of others to be leaders and for all of them as apostles to be called apostles brought a death sentence and all of them excluding possibly john the apostle end up paying with their lives for that amazing and awful responsibility of being an apostle tertullian said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church and it's still to this day what am i learning from the life of james i learned that passion 
is not something that is to be um, to be criticized, but passion needs to be guided. Passion needs to be directed in the right way. Sometimes it's your passion that makes you criticize your brothers. Sometimes it's your passion that makes you feel that you are the only one that is passionate. It's passion that makes you think you're better than everybody else. It's this passion that will cause you to judge. And that's what James did. Lord, they are resisting us. They are, uh, um, they're, they're, they're not nice to us. Let's call fire down from heaven and we'll burn them up. Misguided judgment, misguided passion can, call, can, can make you very judgmental. Misguided passion can also make you proud. However, what I learned from James is that this unmovable faith makes him the first martyr. Surely James had to learn some lessons. But his life, his faith, his example, lives to this day so let's learn to guide our passion in a way that not only honors God but is helpful to others remember God is not in the business of repeating history God is in the business of offering grace mercy love there was a time when men used to commit crazy atro atrocities in the name of god like james wanting to bring fire from heaven you can only look at the history of this island and you understand how Easy it is to fall into the trap of misguided passion. So what I want you to understand today is simply this. God is in the business of grace. He assigned one day for judgment and until that day comes what we have, uh, what we, the only thing that we have, we have nothing else. To offer to people but God's grace. Let's allow God to be the judge. May God bless you. Keep you and encourage you. In your faith. Take care.